So we said a little bit to, to kind of set the stage for what's happening in this chapter, but let's start kind of from, from the beginning uh, in a more sort of systematic way. What is, what are the things to know? So we're talking about energy this chapter. We're going to be covering this pile of things, uh, but I'd like to start by defining work. And I'll, you know, I'll use exactly the definition we did in the, um, in the motivation, you know, in the part with the handwritten notes, force times distance. It, if a force is applied and it causes some displacement in its direction, <clears throat> then uh, we can say that that force does some work. Okay, so let's think about the formula for a second. If we lift twice the load one story, or lift the load, one load, twice as far, both of those situations result in equal work done. Either we're moving something a particular distance that is, you know, has a, a weight of two, let's say, or we're moving a weight of one twice the distance. So we end up with the same kind of product. Lifting a barbell from the floor, we need to exert a force equal or slightly greater to that barbell's weight. So we'd use some force and we move it through a displacement from the floor to, you know, clean position and yep that's work the unit for force i'm sorry the unit for work is the unit for force newton times the unit for distance meters so we can say newton meters or to save ourselves a little bit of work pardon not intended uh, we can use the derived unit joules, and we'll say more about uh, the person that this unit is named after in a few chapters. But this is the unit for work is joules. Okay. Now, if I walk up a flight of stairs. I need to apply a force equal to my weight or maybe slightly greater than my weight to the floor so that the floor pushes on me and I go up. That's some force applied over some vertical distance. So I have done some amount of work to make that happen. If I run up the flight of stairs, same stairs, same body, same force. All I need to do is keep it from slowing down. I need, I'm constant speed all the way up the stairs. So I have to use the same force to do that because I need to lift my body. That's all I gotta do. To stay at constant speed, I need to counteract the force of gravity. Whether I'm going slowly or quickly, that's all I gotta do. And I'm going to go up a flight of stairs. Now, we know from experience that one of those things is harder to do, right? If I run up the flight of stairs, I get more tired. <laughs> it's more effort. But our definition here of work doesn't get at the question of how tired I am afterwards. In the handwritten notes part, we said that sliding a distance across a frictional floor, that's a force applied for a distance. And we can talk about the work that friction does. We also said that there's a difference in the time. 
during which that work is done, right? If we're going faster when we start, it's going to take us less time to cover a distance, a particular distance against friction because well, we're moving faster the whole time. So the same amount of work because force and distance is done in less time. Just like when I run up the stairs, I do the same amount of work to move my body in less time because it takes me less time to get there. I'm traveling at a faster speed. So we need another kind of thing to talk about how tired I get. And I'd like to define that as power. How quickly are we doing work? How much work did you do? I moved this body up a flight of stairs. How much time did it take you to do it? The faster you complete the job, the greater the power that's required because we're doing the same amount of work. The numerator is the same, but the denominator decreases if we go faster. So that, that's, this is the thing that gets at the idea that if we do the same task twice as fast, the work that we do is the same as far as physics is concerned, but we needed to have more power available to do that. An engine twice as powerful as another one can either do twice the work in the same amount of time or the amount of work of one engine in half the time as that other engine. The rate at which we are changing energy from one form to another. What, what is that? <laughs> Wait a minute. What is energy? We didn't define energy yet. I mean, I see the word here, but this is what this. Okay, so that's an open question. We've got to figure out what this is. The rate at which energy, oops, energy is changed from one form to another. Uh, okay, so that's that's an open question. We got to circle back to that. The unit of power, because it's work done divided by time, is joules per second which we name after James Watt, the developer of the steam engine. One joule per second is one watt. Uh, it makes me think of a story. Uh, I was talking to my dad once and he said something, I, I don't, to this day, I still don't know what he said, uh, but I didn't understand it. So I said, what? So he repeated himself and I still didn't understand it. So I said, what? And then he said, are you a light bulb? And I said, what? <laughs> and he laughed and said, you're giving off what? You're, you're giving off power. Uh, oh, dad. <laughs> um, that's the end of the story. That's all I got. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not a dad yet, but I've been practicing my dad joke game for a long time. I learned from you know, one of the greats. <laughs> okay. So we know the unit for power, but this, this thing about energy changing forms, well, first of all, changing forms, and second of all, energy? Let's define energy. Energy and matter are 
basically the building blocks of the universe. <clears throat> if we're going to move the matter around, it's energy that does that, a mover of substances. Energy is a thing, and it's something that we do. It's a process. We can see it. We can see evidence of it when it's being transferred or when it's being transformed. And we've talked already about conserved quantities. We, we talked about if the sum of the forces acting on a thing is zero, then the momentum of a thing is conserved. However much momentum we have, we continue to have. Energy is a little bit different. In terms of the sort of physical tracking of, an ob of some matter, maybe in our you know, spreadsheet accounting for the energy associated with that thing, we don't seem to have as much present as we did before, but that's only because it has changed forms to something we can't quite get at. For example, if you take your hands and rub them together, because your hands are cold, they warm up. The friction between your hands creates heat, releases energy in the form of heat. The motion of your hands, that's, that's mechanical. That's, that's a physical movement of thing. Getting our hands to do that had to do with the chemical and electrical uh, properties of our musculature and skeletons and so on. <clears throat> and that had to do with the food that we ate and that had to do with the solar energy coming to uh, create, you know, to, to facilitate photosynthesis so that the, you know, cow could eat the grass so that we could eat the cow so that we would have the capability to move our hands back and forth to eventually, finally, take the solar energy and convert it into thermal energy. And now that we've done that, it's, it's not gone. We warm up our hands and then slowly our hands cool off and that thermal energy dissipates into the environment, in the air around my hands. And I can't get it back. So, you know, according to one particular way of looking at things, that energy is gone, but it's not destroyed. It's just not where it used to be anymore. And it's never going to be again. It's, it's been, you know, dispersed. Energy is the thing that in any full bookkeeping of the universe, it's the thing that is conserved. We don't lose it. It changes forms and maybe it's hard to find again, but it's still there. It's just whether we can, you know, get at it or not, use that energy to do something else, say. <clears throat> Among its various definitions, energy is the name that we give to the ability of a system or an object to do work. Now, if I take a stapler and I throw it at this window, the stapler could break the glass. Now, how, how, is, a, how, how is a stapler capable of exerting a force on glass, you know, because this stapler has been on my desk for weeks and it hasn't so much as, you know, pushed on anything. It doesn't have that ability until I throw it, right? And then again, we convert the, uh, you know, electrochemical energy that we have in our arm, the ability we have to do work 
And that work transfers the energy we spent doing that to the stapler. So now the stapler, because when it hits that glass, it's gonna push on it and it's gonna push it through some distance. It's gonna break it and push the glass. That's work. How is the stapler able to do that? Well, it must have energy. Where did it get the energy? Well, it came from me. Where did I get it? It came from the food. So it's, it, it's this sort of ongoing transfer process. It's not a thing that we just find somewhere. There's no pile of energy over there that I can go take a shovel full of. It's, it's always changing form from one form to another. Now, as far as motion, the kind of the kinds of things we've been talking about for the last six chapters, let's restrict ourselves to mechanical energy, not electromagnetic energy or thermal energy, which we'll talk about in, a, in several chapters. But the, the physical motion of our hands back and forth, that's mechanical energy. The fact that if I stretch this slinky and release it, it springs back. That is what we'll call potential energy. We stretch it and right now, it's not in motion, but you and I both know that it could be. I set the slinky on the desk and it's just gonna sit there. But if I move it a little bit farther, now I haven't really done anything to it. I just picked it up and slid it off the desk, but now you and I both know it can fall. It couldn't do that before. And uh, barring some sort of violent disturbance like an earthquake or something, it'll sit here on the desk forever. There is potential energy of some configuration. We've got to change the physical state of a thing so that it could possibly move. Kinetic, we've seen this word kinetic before when we were talking about kinetic friction and it was the friction that was associated with sliding, motion, right? So kinetic energy has something to do with motion and we've seen this already being in the handwritten notes part of the of the video. Stored energy held in readiness maybe could do some work. A stretched rubber band has stored energy and is capable of doing work on a, you know, a metal ball that we're going to shoot at somebody or Something, let's not shoot at anybody. Maybe a crumpled up paper that we're gonna, some, some sort of Nerf item <laughs> that we're gonna, that we're, uh, yeah, that's not slingshot ball bearings at anybody. But the stretched rubber band, now the rubber band on its own, it's not gonna do anything. We have to stretch it and hold that energy ready if we release the configuration that rubber band can now do work because because we know it will apply a force on that crumpled up piece of paper it'll apply a force through some distance as it snaps back force over distance that's work how did the rubber band do that well we did some work to change the configuration of the rubber band and we stored the work that we did as potential energy. The other familiar kind of potential energy is that kind I was talking about, about the slinky. Potential energy due to elevated position. If I talk about this eraser, I hold it some height above the floor, it could as soon as I released it, just like the rubber band, fall and hit the floor. If we start with it on the floor, it's like the unstretched rubber band. It's just hanging out. Nothing's going to happen. I could stand here all night and watch the eraser. It will not do anything. But if I go get the rubber band, uh, 
if I go get a rubber band and then stretch it, then it can do work on a thing. Same story with the eraser. If I pick the eraser up, think of it like stretching the gravity spring, right? We, we, I was looking at that slinky a second ago, where did I put it? If I pull the slinky up, it'll spring back down. Pull the slinky to the side, it'll spring back across. And gravity is the same way. If I pull the eraser up, stretching the gravity spring, when I let go, gravity's gonna pull it back. We already know that gravity causes things to fall. This is another way to tell that same story. We put the eraser and floor in a configuration such that it we have stretched the gravity spring. And when we release it, the gravity spring is gonna spring back because that's what springs do. And we could do work on the eraser. Gravity is about to do positive. It's gonna exert a force down and it's gonna pull the eraser through a distance. A distance equal to the height that I have lifted it. So gravity is gonna exert mass times G, the acceleration due to gravity. That's the force that gravity is going to exert. And it's gonna exert that force over a distance H above the floor. So how much work can gravity do in this lifted stretched gravity spring situation? MGH. So we could say that this is a configuration of eraser and floor in which there is potential energy stored. How much? MGH. Ball weighs 10 Newtons and it doesn't matter how we get it three meters off the floor. As long as it's three meters off the floor, if we took away the reason it wasn't falling, if we removed all the supports, it would fall three meters and gravity would be pulling by with a force of 10 Newtons. So 10 Newtons, three meters, 10 times three is 30 joules in every case. Doesn't matter how we got there, just that we are three meters off the ground. In the handwritten notes part, we defined kinetic energy. And just a minute ago, we did. It's energy, so it, it has to do with the ability to do work. I talked about throwing the stapler at the window. The stapler would then be in motion, and it, by virtue of being in motion, as opposed to just setting the stapler against the window, nothing's gonna happen. It's gotta be moving in order to break the thing, in order to exert a force and push the window. In order to do work, remember energy is the ability to do work. So if the stapler is going to be able to do work on the window, it's because it has energy. Which kind? Well, it's moving, kinetic. It depends on the mass of the object, which makes sense. If the stapler were twice as massive and I threw it the same way, it would probably hurt more if it hit the window. We need the factor of a half for reasons. And it is proportional to the square of the speed. And that square speed proportionality is exactly the one that y'all found when you were looking at the puck sliding over off the cart onto the surface. He said that stopping distance was related to the square of the speed. Why? Well, 
we've already answered the question why, but here's another way to tell the story. Friction is doing work. It's exerting a force over a distance. It's doing work. And the amount of work that it does varies not like the speed, but like the square of the speed. That's what y'all found experimentally. So we know we need speed squared in our formula. One half times the mass times the speed squared. The work energy relationship, work kinetic energy, is known as the work energy theorem. If we talk about the forces that are doing work on an object, add them all up together, they will create some change in the motion of that object by doing work. The change in the kinetic energy that they create is exactly equal to the work that they do together. And that is as a result, we, we showed that, is as a result of Newton's second law. For, I don't know, since chapter two, we have been talking about the relationship as Galileo observed, and then as Newton kind of rewrote between force and acceleration. And we keep sort of retelling the same story we hold up an object and we look at it from a slightly different vantage point. We hold up a bottle of water and it looks this way if you hold it up, right? But if you turn it this way, it's a whole other thing. Now it's a circle instead of some weird oblong shape. The different ways we hold this idea that the causes of motion are forces and the effects are motion. <laughs> Forces cause or affect motion, that that's the story we're telling over and over and over again. We told it in Newton's second law, um, force equals mass times acceleration. Then we told it again in impulse equals change in momentum. And here we are telling it again, net work done is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. It's all the same idea. It's just a matter of what's easier to calculate. The fantastic thing about energy, one half m speed squared. Now, if we're going to the right, velocity is positive. If we're going to the left, velocity is negative. Fine, if we square that, it doesn't matter. It's positive either way. Energy and work are scalar. We don't need to worry about which way we're going. That's why we're writing it as speed and not velocity. It doesn't matter which way we're going. What does your speedometer say? What's your mass? Boom, you know how much kinetic energy. That's great because now we don't need to worry about the fact that momentum is a vector and that the, you know this way it's positive and this way it's negative or whatever. It's all just energy. Apl applying the brakes to stop a car, work is done on it. Or if it's not brakes, if it's just friction friction supplied by the brakes or just by the contact between that puck and the surface in the pivot activity. And we know from the experiment that it's proportional to the square speed, exactly like we expected. Kinetic energy and momentum are closely related. They're similar, but they're not the same. It's true that if your velocity 
If your speed is zero, then you have neither. Both, both kinetic energy and momentum describe moving things. However, momentum is a vector quantity. So therefore, equal amounts of momentum this way and that way add to zero. Kinetic energy is not that. It's scalar. So 10 joules this way and 10 joules that way, it's not really a thing worth saying. It's just 10 joules and 10 joules, which adds up to 20. Momentum varies like velocity. Momentum is mass times velocity, just that. Kinetic energy depends on the square of the velocity. So we've got an object moving as a mass and it's moving with some velocity. So it has some momentum and it has some kinetic energy. Now, if we double its velocity, doubling the velocity means that we double the momentum. Doubling the velocity means that we're doubling the momentum. Doubling the velocity means when we square the double that we've multiplied the kinetic energy by a factor of four. So not only is it true that momentum is vector and kinetic energy is scalar, they also depend differently as we change the velocity, but momentum and kinetic energy change differently. <clears throat> energy is the thing that cannot be created or destroyed. We can transfer from one form into another, like from potential into kinetic. We release the configuration and it transfers from potential into motion, kinetic energy. The total amount of energy present never changes, just sometimes it becomes not mechanical anymore. Remember, we're talking about kinetic or potential. If it isn't one of those things, then it's not mechanical energy and it's transformed into something else. Like when we rub our hands together, that thermal energy that's not mechanical any anymore. And it leaves the system of my hands. It gets dissipated, dispersed into the air around my hands. The total amount of energy present in the universe, it's still what it was. I just moved it around from my cells and muscles to my hands physically moving to the thermal energy, to the thermal energy of the air. Yep, we're just moving it around. Now, if there aren't, if we can ignore transfers away from a mechanical system. So we do some work to lift some object, a pile driver, where's my mouse, there it is. We did some work to turn this crank to lift this thing. Then we release the handle and it falls under the influence of gravity. We have stretched the gravity spring and gravity gives us that energy back. We spent energy doing work to move the thing. We stored that energy in gravitational potential energy. When we release the system, we get that energy back. As long as we can ignore air resistance and friction and other things like that, we get that energy back mechanically. It becomes kinetic energy. Now, when it slams into the uh, pile that we're trying to drive, we get a force exerted on that. We end up pushing the thing further down. We've done some work, but it's stuck in the ground. So the energy that we have, like it's, it's gone now. The thing has fallen, it's hit, it's driven into the ground, and that's the end. The energy was 
dissipated into the ground. And you could feel that, right? Like if you've got your hand on one side of the wall and I hit the wall over here, you can feel that impact in your hand against the wall because that energy is being propagated through the, the medium of the wall, just like it would be through the medium of the ground in the pile driver example. But from if, if we restrict ourselves just to, we do some work to lift it, gravity stores that energy, we release, it becomes kinetic, and that kinetic energy does some useful work for us. Conservation of mechanical energy. Most real systems don't completely conserve mechanical energy. If we stretch a bow, a bow string to shoot an arrow, when we release it, some of the stored energy is converted, most in fact, is converted into kinetic energy. The bowstring moves, which does work on the arrow to push it, but a little bit of the energy that was stored becomes thermal energy and the string warms up a little bit. That thermal energy then gets dissipated into the environment. The better the conversion from one form of energy to another, the happier we are, the, the less it feels like we're, you know, wasting energy. But it's not gone. It just changes forms to something less useful for us. Broadly speaking, a machine is a device that looks at the work that we do and manipulates either the force or the distance so that we get an advantage. We can trade force for distance. <clears throat> We can move energy around within a system, transfer, you know, change the form of the energy, but we cannot end up with more energy than we had to begin with. We can't just get something for nothing. The work that we put in is the work that we put out. So the input work, force times distance, should be equal to the output work, force times distance. A lever, or a lever, is a machine. If we move the side farther away from the fulcrum through a distance D, we don't have to try very hard. We can use a relatively small force to do that. We're gonna end up moving the other side through a much smaller distance. These are related triangles, but this one is smaller. <clears throat> so this distance is smaller but the force will be bigger because the input and output work has to be the same. Otherwise, we don't have energy conservation. So a relatively small force applied over a large distance gets us a large force if it's applied over a small distance. And it's this you know, relationship that allows a crank jack to lift a car. We move the handle through a large distance and it jacks up the car a little bit. We can, you know, we're applying, you know, human-sized force to move the handle, 
but we're getting car sized force out because we're restricting our output distance to something small. A pulley. Essentially, in this configuration, operates like a lever with, you know, it's a seesaw, both sides are the same length. All we're doing is changing the direction. It might be easier for me to pull down than it is to pull up. So if what I need to do is lift a box, I want a thing that changes the direction of my force. I can pull down with more force, maybe because I can like take my feet off the ground and put my whole weight on the rope. I can be more forceful than if I'm trying to lift the thing. So I need, but what I want to do is lift it. So I need a machine that will change the direction of my force. And we can leverage pulleys to multiply force, just like we used a lever, because they're the same. This diagram is kind of confusing to me. And I think we could convince ourselves that it makes sense. But think about this. There's this side of the rope and then this side of the rope and the weight of the load. Two supports, one on the ceiling and one in our hands to hold up one load. Okay, so each support gets half the load. So we're able to lift something twice as heavy as we are capable of lifting because we're using the setup of the pulley to multiply our force. Now, we can't lift it as far because as we pull the rope up, the thing turns and it, it doesn't go up quite as far as we pull the rope, but at least we can lift the thing. Now, that rope that's turning through that pulley wheel, there's some friction there. Friction is gonna tend to reduce the amount of useful work that we get out from the amount that we put in. How efficient is the machine? Well, how much did we get out relative to how much we put in? What was our return on that investment out of the original investment? Now we know we've said energy isn't gonna be created. So we're not gonna be any better than 100%. But I guess the question is, how close to 100% can we be? One way to improve efficiency is to figure out a way to use the leftover, you know, the, the dissipated energy. Edison used the byproduct heat from power plants to heat nearby buildings. We would need to heat them anyway, it's cold out. And we would be producing this leftover, like this thermal energy that we can't get back anyway, might as well use it to warm up that house next door. So if we can sort of increase the amount of the energy 
that we do end up using, even though it has changed form, you know, it's not, it's not the, the physical motion anymore, but it's something else. Maybe we can leverage that form of it and sort of increase our efficiency that way. <clears throat> the human body has an efficiency problem too. And in fact, all organisms have an efficiency problem. There is more energy stored in the food than in the metabolized chemical products. It's, it's an efficiency problem. The, the healthier the food we eat, the better the efficiency to some degree, but there's, there's always still this idea that if we metabolize a hydrocarbon, some of the energy produced doesn't go to running the body, some of it goes to leftover thermal energy. Which is why our body temperature is so much warmer than our external environment most of the time. That's, I mean, there are good reasons, I suppose, for, you know, and the human machine has adapted to use that to its advantage. But on a certain level, that's inefficient, right? <laughs> Uh, because just like warming up our hands, our hands eventually cool down again because the environment is cooler than they are. Same, same thing is happening with our body. That's why we wear clothes, to try to keep the energy where it is. Here's a handful of slides um, that are labeled sources of energy, and I don't actually think that's the, the best title, um, but I left it so that I could say that basically. Um, source of energy isn't really a thing that, because it can't be created. It's not that we can go to a fountain, turn on the fountain, and then there's some energy coming out. It's, it's all changing forms from one form to another. The sun is releasing energy, giving off energy by smacking helium atoms together hydrogen atoms to create helium and helium to create heavier elements. That's, that's what's going on. And the energy produced is given off in terms of light and heat. Does that mean it's a source of energy? No, there's energy stored in hydrogen atoms. And when we smash two of them together, we release that energy, just like our bodies burning sugar to release energy, there's some efficiency there. And eventually the sun will spend its available supply of hydrogen and run out. It's, it's not a source of energy, it's a machine. Its job is to transfer energy from, you know, that stored in hydrogen and helium to transfer that energy into light and heat. We can, we can do our best to leverage that incoming energy. And, you know, uh, a lot has been made here recently of the um, energy harvesting alternatives to, uh, you know, fossil fuels. We can um, collect the energy coming in as light and store it electrically and use that. And if we could, right now it's an efficiency problem. If we could catch and store that energy with some efficiency, more energy from the sun is incident upon the earth in an hour. 
than all 7 billion humans use in a year. We just need to collect it and collect it efficiently. And that's that a lot of work is being done to improve the efficiency and the, the you know, collective capabilities of solar panels. A battery here in the picture is used to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. We could run it backwards in a fuel cell, hydrogen and oxygen are squished together to create water and the resulting energy that's released is produced at battery terminals. So it's a, it's a, uh, at fuel cell terminals. Same story, we're converting the chemical energy stored in hydrogen and oxygen molecules. We're converting that energy into electricity. Nuclear power, we're doing the same, well, we're, we're talking about doing the same thing the sun is doing. So far, we are only doing uh, fission, not fusion. We're taking large elements and smacking them together and making smaller ones. Uh, which is, you know, um, productive, right? It, there's there's a, a high yield of, of energy, but it takes a bunch of doing to, to get ready to do that. And it creates problematic byproducts, which we haven't quite figured out how to use, like Edison used the leftover heat to heat the nearby buildings. The earth itself could be a source of energy. Well, source, a place where energy is stored that we could release, that we could convert into a form that we could use. So if we pump water deep into the earth where it is naturally hotter, we could heat up the water so that it becomes steam and that rising steam could turn a turbine. Turning a turbine could produce electricity. As the energy that the rising steam has is converted into mechanical energy of the turbine, which is converted into electrical energy to do, you know, to run things, uh, appliances, right? That steam loses, you know, its energy is transferred away and it becomes liquid water again and it's pumped back down to repeat the process. It's all about changing forms from thermal to mechanical to electrical back to thermal. It is in a lot of ways, Well, that's it's one of the questions of our time. The needs of society with respect to power are not going away. And this is this is, you know, the the the, the cutting edge of applied physics, chemistry, geology you know, multiple disciplines coming together to address this efficiency issue. Um, fossil fuels have their own problems, as you know, having, you know, uh, having to do with emissions and their own inefficiencies. Um, a lot of the thermal energy produced by the burning of fossil fuels is not um, is is not collected and, and becomes dispersed into the environment along with problematic byproduct chemicals. Um, so I mean, this is in a lot of way, you know, energy and ways to leverage the energy that is present to do something useful for us 
in a way that is sustainable, that's um, that's a big open open question. A lot of there's a lot of work being done in in a lot of different fields on this front. Um, but yeah, this is uh, so yeah. <laughs> This is, this is in a lot of ways the big deal, um, one could argue. but certainly a big deal, one of the top five, I think, um, facing, you know, civilization in the next, I think for the, for the last 50 years, but certainly for the next 50. Um, Yeah. All right. That's what I have for you. In a couple of weeks, after we say a little bit more about, um, after we say a little bit more about the structure of matter and liquids and solids and gases, and then say a little bit more about um, thermal physics. We uh, will take a look at the sort of combination of the ideas that we just talked about, and the, that that additional, you know, once we have you know encountered the the relationships and theorems and laws having to do with those kinds of questions, that that kind of scenario. Uh, will will actually sort of confront some of these uh, some of these questions about energy and efficiency and and um, I hope that that's I hope that that's interesting I hope that that's um, you know engaging so thanks for your attention see you in class.